singing that song. Say oh. There's nobody like you. None who compares to you. Come on, just one more time in this room. Say oh. Sometimes, and many of us find ourselves in this position in worship, 
we know that God is worthy of everything we have to give. And so we will give it all to him. Many of us should be really happy that as much as we've shouted to God this week that nobody put a microphone in front of our face. Because by now, I'm sure that many of you, like many of us up here, don't have your full voice. But we are willing to give him everything. I won't steal his testimony, but I think that we should never take the ability to sing to God or shout to God for granted. We heard today from the incomparable Bob Sorge. And the first time I heard you, I think it might have been 1997. I used to say I'm older than I look, but now I have a bunch of gray hair, so I can't hide it anymore. And I remember a statement that you made back then that reminded me how precious it is to be able to sing to God. Because you made a statement then, you said, oh God, how am I supposed to praise you now? You took my voice. And you said, that God said, but I didn't take your tears. Because we like to say stuff God, if I took everything from me, if you took, I would still, would you? Or if you have been preaching for over 40 years around the world and you get cancer in your throat, and you have to be on vocal arrest for over a year, like Pastor Rod Parsley, you would not take for granted the ability to give God praise with your voice. I think you just got it. I think you just got it. I think you just got the privilege that we have to give him glory. together God releases something in the atmosphere that we take back home with us he releases a lot of things but every year there's that we've gathered together God's given us some sort of declaration that we can't stop singing when we get home and I just think uh, we just need to sing this to the Lord one more time say no
basically we just pass the mic to people in a moment and say take it and at no point during habitation this year have I given an introduction of a worshiper because every genuine worshiper doesn't want the attention of the spotlight put on them anyway they would prefer that to get out of the way and let Jesus shine but typically especially this year all the worshipers surrounding this gathering are all family and known to you but God grows the family yeah moments in the kingdom where God will lend people some of his songs in the treasury and he will allow that song to permeate the earth and for him to for a song to cross the earth has to have the breath of God on it I'll never forget, um, Pastor Nathaniel will know this person. Her name is Elsie Obed. And uh, Pastor Sam, do you know her? Elsie Obed from Nigeria. I mean, it's a large, yes. I mean, not like, you know. <laughs> I just realized what I did right there. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, you know David from the West Coast of the United States? <laughs> you know? Nigeria is way bigger than most of us realize, so I'm sorry that I just did that. That was horrible. <laughs> I know that Pastor Nathaniel knows her because he ministers with her, but I, I'll never forget the first time she invited me to worship His Majesty King Jesus. And she said to me, congratulations on the success of your song. And me being me, I was like, well, it's not me, it's the Lord. She said, no, no, I know you know that. She said, congratulations because the Lord accepted your song. And she said, because the Lord accepted your song, he allowed it to go across the world. Yeah. It brings a whole new meaning to let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And um, I'm excited because we have a new family member about to join the family. <laughs> One of the most down-to-earth people you'll ever meet. And um, God has given him a song that all of you know. The whole world sings. Would you welcome to Habitation our friend, Corey Asbury.
was your foe. When I was your foe, still your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. And when I felt no worth, when I felt no worth, you paid it all. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, great is love, God. Who always chases me down, fights till I found in the 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. You better help me. There's no shadow tonight. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't. Woo. I never heard it sound better. There's no wall you won't. Lie you won't. No shadow now. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't. Come in. There's not a single wall tonight. There's no wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming out There's no shadow now, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming out to me. No wall, no wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming out to me. There's no shadow now, no shadow you won't light up. There's no one, no one you won't get out, now you won't get out, you're coming out today, oh the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love God, who always chases me down, Christ and I'm down, he's the 99, and I couldn't Coming out to 
to do with myself up here. <laughs> wow. Father, we thank you for your overwhelming kindness in our lives. Right now, all across the room, just look into his eyes. See the smile on his face. He's not mad at you. He's not mostly disappointed. There's a smile on his face. Some of you, to your surprise, there's a smile on his face. And we mess up over and over a million times. And he leans down and he takes us by the hand and he picks us up again. He places us on that solid rock and he puts that new song in our mouths. And we sing. Oh, we sing to you, Father. Hey, I love you. I just love you. I love you, Father. Ooh. Ooh. We look right into your eyes tonight. Speak over us your affection again. Sing over us your love again. Make it real tonight. Like a father looking in the eyes of his baby for the first time. Let us see it again. The tenderness. The gleam in your eye. As you look, your sons and your daughters. Your excellent ones in whom is all of your delight. All of your pleasure. Cause I'm no longer the slave to fear, no, tonight. But I am a child of God. Help me. 
to say Say I'm no longer a slave to fear No, 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 no But I am a child Come on, every voice, no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I'm a child But I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear, no, no, but I am a child of God. And you unravel me. And you unravel me with a melody. And you surround me with a song. From my enemies, Father, to all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave, and I no longer a slave to fear. And I'm your son tonight, but I am a child of God. Yes, I am. Say, say, I'm no longer a slave. God, say it again, no longer. I'm no longer the slave to fear. But I am a child of God, yes I am. And I'm no longer the slave to fear. Oh, no. But I am a child of God. Sound of sons and daughters tonight. Oh, oh, the song of freedom. Oh, oh, come on. But I am a child. Say it again like you mean it. I'm no longer. I am now. But I am a child. One more time, every voice. I'm no longer. But I am. Sing this together. You split the seas. 
tonight. Cause you split the sea so I could My fears are drowned. You rescued me, Father. the voices now cause you split the sea so I could walk right through it my fears were drowned in her blood you rescued me so I could stand and sing alright that sounds too good we gotta do that one more time you split the seas tonight Cause you split the sea so I could walk. Yeah. Whoa. Come on. You rescue me so I I am. You better do it one more time. I promise last time. You split. Ha. You split the sea so I could walk. My fears are drowned.
You see the glory, feel the wind, you drink from the river, and jump right in, cause heaven's open, yeah, it's all around us, in your presence. Let our voices rise. Come on, sing it. Sing it out in English. Hallelujah. Tongue is lonely and Join with heaven's song. Sing it out in English. Hallelujah. Tonight. Yeah. There's nothing better. The 
Somebody give Jesus praise now. Can you also do two more favors for me? Can you let Miranda know that you appreciate her? Now, I want you to know, wait, 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 wait. If you've never heard her, you still haven't yet. Because she came and she lost her voice completely. And over the past two days has been praying and resting and believing God that he would restore her voice. And she gave everything she had. So would you let her know that you appreciate her? I don't see her, but yeah. That's the second thing I want you to do. Would you let Corey Asbury know that we appreciate him? I think, I think he was like a kid in a candy store listening to y'all. <laughs> you, can, you can be seated. You can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. There is a word from the Lord tonight. We're going to have the opportunity to respond in worship to all that we've been receiving from the Lord these past few days. How many, when it's time to go back home, bless you, that's a real sneeze, my God. <laughs> Uh, bless you or cast it out. I figured it bless you. Just <laughs> How many know that you're going home changed? Yeah? The rest of you are not convinced yet? We got two more sessions. You're going home changed. <laughs> Tired in your body, refreshed in your spirit. Yeah. Can we receive at this time my pastor, Bishop Joseph Garlington? Can you help me show honor here? Come on. Be seated in heavenly places. Oh, man. There's a character in the book of Daniel 
who is called the little horn. And the Bible says he will wear out the saints. These are little horn meetings. My former pastor's church was in revival and one of his neighbors, they were trying to invite him to the meeting and he, his neighbor said, he said, man, I ain't got time to go to your church. It takes time to serve the Lord. The Bible says one day in his courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. And I ask people, say, where can you get a 1,000 1, return on your investment? Can't do it at a baseball game or a football game or the movies. But in a place like this, you can make some exchanges and get a return on your investment. And I am so, I'm so delighted to be here with Pastor Rod. It's, my wife said, I've never met him before. I said, well, you'll meet him tonight. And so we want to do more than meet you, sir. So as Britney Spears said to her second husband, I won't keep you long, all right? <laughs> so I've been asked to receive the offering. And I want to share some principles with you that I think will help you. Faith comes by hearing. Say it again. Faith comes by hearing. What I want to say is intended to raise your faith to believe that God can do a whole lot more with you than you can imagine. This is a this isn't just a millennial church, but they do live, they do use a different translation than I do, and I've been submitted, and so I'm going to the New Living Translation, but it's painful. <laughs> I don't remember any verses from the New Living Translation. But here's a passage that I want to get to you so that you can get this. 2 Kings 6, verse 1. One day the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Tell somebody next to you, say, this is that place that's too small. I want to just share with you for a few minutes what it takes to develop a culture of generosity. I don't know if you were here when Pastor Sam shared today. I told him I couldn't believe all of that came out of one guy. And I knew there was still more left. And that was the part that's painful. Africans can preach. They see things in, they see things in the Bible you don't see until they show it to you. And he talked about culture and how language is important for culture. And took the passage in Genesis 11 where God said, everybody say that, God said. God said. Say it again. God. God said the people are one, their language is one, and their purpose is one, and now nothing that they intend to do will be impossible. When your people are one, and your language is one, and your purpose is one, you can do anything. You can do anything. Culture, very simply, is the way we do things around here. I can give you other definitions, but essentially that is what it is. It's the way we do things around here. So people come and say, what are you doing? I say, well, culture. Peter Drucker says, culture can eat strategy for breakfast. You can have all the strategy you want, but you can't change a whole lot if you don't understand how you need to change the culture. So let me just give you several things that I believe are important as far as Developing a culture of generosity is concerned. Number one, giving begins with yourself. Giving begins with you. Are there, you got those notes for me? Who is the guy in the picture? <laughs> I mean, 
trying to figure that out. It's not you, is it? No. Who is it? Ralph. Ralph. Just said, man, who is that guy? Who is that masked man? Just <laughs> giving yourself. 2 Corinthians 8, 5 says, they even did more than we had hoped for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. Your first action in generosity is to give yourself to the Lord. The song says, I give myself away so you can use me. Churchill said we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Principle number two, we, we need to give at appointed times, at the feasts of the Lord. And, uh, and I'd like to, to share the verse, Exodus 23, 15, with this one thought, that when they come together to celebrate, it's a party. It's a great time. You set aside resources for it. You set aside portions so that when you come, you can celebrate, you can eat, you can enjoy. And he says, no one may appear before me without an offering. It reads that way in the translation I'm reading from, but don't come empty-handed. It's not a threat. It's a hint that when you come to times of feasting and times of celebration, you bring an offering because you can't find a better time to sow a seed when you're in a conference like this. Paul says to the Galatians, we sow to the Spirit. You think you're putting it in a basket, but it's not a basket that gets it. You sow to the Spirit. Principle number three, I believe giving helps you to find your destiny. Do you remember when Saul was looking for the donkeys? I like the King, I like the King James translation best, though. He was looking for his asses. You know, I love the King James because you can say bad words and get away with it. Just... <laughs> so they're trying to find the donkeys and they can't find them and, and Saul is dissatisfied and he says, let's go back home. And the servant says, let's not do that. There is a man of God in the city and everything he says comes to pass. Let's go and let him tell us our way. And Saul says, but we don't have a gift to bring to him. And look at the passage, please. He says, even though our food is gone, we don't have a thing to give him. Well, the servant said, I have one small silver piece. We can at least offer it to the man of God and see what happens. I believe there have been more times in your life when, when what you were looking for, God showed you because of an act of generosity. He was looking for donkeys, but found out he was a king because somebody gave an offering. What are you looking for? What destiny is evading you because you're hanging on to your resources? Number four, say number four. Give when you recognize a prophetic atmosphere. Now I need to say to you, if you don't know this, this is, say it, a prophetic atmosphere. There was a man of God standing on this platform this morning and he was very kind for a while. And then he took it, and I took it personal. But it was a prophetic atmosphere. And when you recognize a prophetic atmosphere, that's when you need to be impelled to do an act of generosity. When the Shunammite woman recognized that Elisha was a man of God, she said, let's do something. She was barren, she wanted a child, her husband was old. I don't know what old has to do with it, but he was old. <laughs> and she said, she said, let's make a room for him. When she made a room for the prophet, she made room for a miracle. If you want miracles, find prophets in whom and to whom you can sow seed. What she desired was given to her simply because she responded to a prophetic moment. 
give to a prophetic promise or an anointed word. I love this passage. It's in 1 Kings 17. God says to Elijah, I'm, I've commanded a widow to sustain you. God said, I have commanded a widow on food stamps. I've commanded a widow on welfare. I've commanded, I mean, we just say, God, that's crazy. No, he says, that's me. And so he goes to her and he says, can you give me some water? And she says, yes, I can give you some water. He says, can you give me some food? She says, not going to give me any food because all I have is this little bit left and I'm going to eat it. And she makes this positive confession and I'm going to die. Give when you see the sense of the stirring in your spirit. You ever look at somebody and just say, I just feel like I'm supposed to do something, and you give. You respond. Listen to this passage. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials that they needed. The man lying by the pool says it like this. I can't, sir. I can't get up, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. I love that part of the New Living Translation, when the water bubbles up. You're in a meeting, and God says, do something. Give something, and you do. And your wife says, I don't think that's enough, and you give more. And he says, I don't think that's enough either. And so, let's see, let's, can we make it a 1,000? Yeah, let's make it a 1,000. And then you leave. And on your way out of the parking lot, you have giver's remorse. And you just... <laughs> but when you respond to the Spirit, the Spirit responds to you. Number seven, give when you need to enlarge your territory. You got a business deal working, give an offering. You got a contract that needs to be signed, give an offering. A man's gift or a woman's gift will make room for her. Make room for her and bring you before great men. Give to the poor. Say that, please. All of this is part of the culture of generosity. God commands us to give to the poor. There's a verse that I think we need to keep in mind. It's in Ezekiel 1649. Did we give you the translation for it? Here's what it says in Ezekiel 1649. This is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. They lived a life of careless ease, and they did not care for the poor. That passage doesn't say one thing about homosexuality. They didn't care for the poor. And then look with me, please. You've got to go to this passage, Acts chapter 10. Hurry up. Acts 10. You slow pokes. Acts 10. Now, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion. I'm reading from the New American Translation. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the only one I have. A devout man who feared God with all his household gave many alms, gave many alms to the Jewish people, prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw a vision, an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, fixing his gaze on him, being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said, your prayers, say it please, and your alms, say it again, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial. Your prayers and your alms, your prayers and your alms. God looks at that and he sees them equal. Your prayers and your alms have ascended to God as a memorial. Think about it like this. God chose an Italian to be the door for the Gentiles. <laughs> I got a Negro at the piano. Um, but he's good. <laughs> Creative, distracting, just but it's all good. A move of God came to you because God saw your act of generosity. I'm going to pick Cornelius. Why? Because his alms, I want, I want a memorial for him. Number nine, given seasons of extreme desperation, Hannah wanted a baby. 
and she was barren. Hannah gave her first. Would you say that, please? Say it again. The widow of Zarephath gave her last. But the poor woman that Jesus saw giving gave her all. God wants your first. He wants your, he wants your all. We're in a house where great effort has gone about to prepare a table for us to minister, to receive. And I'm going to ask you to sow into this deep desire that this family, this leader has to enlarge the territory that enables us to sow and to minister. Do you remember where we used to meet? How small it was? This isn't big enough either. The place is too small. Tell somebody the place is too small. Now, I want to say to you, we want to help you enlarge the place of your habitation. I just thought of that. The place of your habitation. We want to enlarge. Just think on it. Yes, think on it. And here's how we're going to do it. You're going to give money. That's, that's how we're going to do it. The, the Bible in book, the book of Revelation says the kings will bring their glory their glory. It's not their glory, but their glory, their resources. I've asked, I've asked Jason if he would prepare 50 envelopes that I've numbered, and each one of these 50 is worth $1,000. I need 50 people to join me and Pastor Barbara and sewing. Would you bring those? And I'm going to ask those guys, come on, pastors, you know, I already told you what we needed. Come on, you guys. I'm first. I got the first one. Everyone who will take one of these, I need 50 people who will take a $1,000 an envelope. You can take two if you'd like. Be greedy. And would you stay, if you take an envelope, I'm asking the pastors for each one of you who take an envelope, you ministry team, would you all pray for these people who are taking these envelopes? If you've got one, you come and get one. Come on. If, you've been, if you receive something from God, God wants to bless your house. You make his stuff happen. He'll make your stuff happen. Well, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Well, you just got finished singing, I'm no longer a slave to right. fear. Come on. How many do you have? It's got 25. I just need 25 more people just to say, I'll take one of those. Come on. Give up Starbucks for seven weeks. You got it made. I also need a Gideon's 300 group who will take an envelope for $100. This is an amazing time. I just love what God's doing here. And I could tell that Corey was caught up into something. It was like, I'm in a whirlwind and I don't know how to get out. That was my first experience here, man. I just said, what is going on? The guy from Elevation a couple of years ago, he had no idea what hit him. And he started singing like he had never sung before. You're coming. You're coming. You say, well, but didn't we pay a registration? Yes, you did. That was to take care of the expenses that normally occur. And we're doing that. Where's the worship team? There was a little assignment that you guys had. And they sing this line. Rain only led us to those with seed in the ground. Come on, sing that with me. I need some ladies just to lift your voice and say, come on. Almost, almost, come on, it only matters, come on, you want to try it again? We, if we could have the right key, that would be good. 
Come on. All right, let's try it. Lift your voice. Rain only matters to those who have seen. One more time, please. Rain, Rain only matters to those who have seen in the ground. All right. Can you join them in doing that? Please, I, I've got seed in the ground. i got seed in the ground. And, and We've been praying, we've been sowing, now we're crying, heaven send the rain, send the rain, shout it out. church where you received an offering in the first part of the service you went and counted it and then you came back for what they called an after offering we have until tomorrow to see these envelopes disappear everybody standing everybody standing Some of you will have something to give. Some of you will only be able to say, I, I would like to give, but I can't do it now. Whenever you can do it. But open your heart to him. Father, I just thank you for this moment. I thank you for this house. I thank you for this precious anointing that rests upon this season. We are in an open heaven. We are under an open heaven where anything can happen because we believe. And so now I call your people to a place of generosity, to a place of sacrifice, to a place of blessing. In the name of Jesus. If you need an offering envelope other than one of these, raise your hand, wave, and just say, I want in. I want in on all that God's doing. If you're a pastor and you want to open a door in your house, open one in this one. The good you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. So to the word that's going to come tonight, to believe that God's got something for you. You can make checks payable to Deeper Fellowship Church. You can get the app. Get that guy's picture off the screen. Just There's a tab on the app that says Habitation Conference. That's all supposed to be on the screen, too. Are you blessed? Would you tell this man of God, thank you for creating an atmosphere where I can be blessed and receive? Come on, just tell him thank you. That's a patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Bless you. Be seated. The ushers will serve you, wait upon you, 
And uh, would you just welcome Pastor William back again, please? Would y'all stand up, please? Not y'all. I'm talking to you. Y'all like, we've been standing for three days. Can we <laughs> no, we're not going there. <laughs> I was talking to y'all, too. We've been praying. We've been so. Now we're crying. Heaven. Turn on the lights. Say we've been praying. We've been praying. We've been sowing. Now we're crying. Heaven. Send the rain. Send the rain. Send the rain. From those who have seen in the ground say we've been Somebody say it again. Say, we've been praying. We've been praying. Oh, 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 oh. We've been so. Now we're crying. Heaven send the rain. Send the rain. One more time. We've been praying. I can see in the ground. I'm expecting a harvest now. Somebody say, I got seen. Oh, oh. I'm expecting a harvest. Oh! 
I'm expecting. I'm expecting a harvest now. This is for those who have it. I'm expecting a harvest. Come on, keep with expectation one more time and say. Somebody praise God right here. Come on! Like y'all so tired. There's a shifting. In my direction. Can we help them out one time? Come on, say. There's a breaking. Between your plays, why don't you do it right now? starting to understand why we're going to need glorified bodies because you spend this much time in the presence of God you feel fatigued but he's worthy of more <laughs> you can rest when you get home in the presence of God we're going to give him everything wouldn't it be a shame to come here and leave with your alabaster box with the oil still in it I dare somebody to just break it open right here Tired right there. Okay, okay, okay. See, y'all trying to be, y'all trying to be messy. Listen. Well, don't mess with it if you're gonna do it. One, two, three, go! I want to make sure you're awake. I want to make sure your spirit is open because we're not going to miss what God wants to say to us tonight. So look at your neighbor and say, wake up. God's talking. Wake up. We're under an open heaven. Wake up. 
There's a sifting in your favor. Wake up. There's a breakthrough as you pray. on a breakthrough to come. Don't let this moment pass you by right here. Sitting there tired just five minutes ago. Uh, 
I think you're awake now. I think you're awake now. We got to hear a word from the Lord. So since I'm still hear a smattering of praise in the room, I don't want to cut you off. So give it all to him right now. Come on. standing they um entire time we've been together, God's been giving us language and uh, speaking powerful words to us that are transformative, the kinds of things that ought to change what we say, because language shapes culture, and God has been blowing our mind with revelation and insight prophetic declaration and impartation I'm not just using these words for no reason they've actually been what's been happening to us we have sat at the table of a feast yeah there is very much a marriage happening. Pastor Sam talked about the reality of the spirit and the word being together, being married. And one of the things that's been unique about this is it's not just a, I know some people like to define it as a worship conference, but the truth of the matter is there are prophetic things being released. And there are strategies and concepts being released. There's a gathering of all parts of the body of Christ from all around the world. And, and while we worship together for longer than probably most of you do in your churches, we do that because he's worthy of it. Yeah, he's worthy of it. And yeah. At the same time, the Lord is surrounded this conference for those of you who have been here with prophetic voices and apostolic voices that have really charge us and challenge us to change if you go home the same way it's your fault I know that's a very direct way of saying it but the truth of the matter is you can choose to hold on to what you have or you can receive what God has been releasing and he's releasing a different way of thinking and a different way of speaking. And we called this the language of revival. And they sent me the bio of a short bio of Pastor Rod Parsley. And I looked briefly at it and I said, while we could read these things, really, how can you give the bio of a person who's been in ministry for over 40 years and these are not bio points who has arguably one of, one of the greatest living revivalists in the world that's not a grandiose statement that's a true statement one who is carrying an impartation from those giants who have gone before us that many of us read about in our books. And we like to talk about, oh, if we could see what Lester Summerall saw, if we could see what Smith Wigglesworth saw, we could see, and then the people that carry those impartation, those mantles, there are a lot of folks that are transitioning. And God has 
people on the earth that are still carrying something to impart to a generation. And one of the most amazing things that I could say is that this man of God stayed true to what God called him to do and be when everything else started to change. And everybody said, this is how you should do church now. And you shouldn't do it this long. You can't do it this way. And if you do it that way, you won't attract people. And you won't do this. And you won't do that. And every expert taught us how to do church without the spirit. And so we became professional church presenters. And then something interesting happens when you stay true to your call. It's kind of like if you're building your wardrobe, you can spend a whole lot of money trying to keep up with the trends, or you can buy the classics. Because there's certain things that will never go out of style. The move of the spirit will never go out of style. I don't hear anybody in this church right now. It's so interesting because, as you know, revival is a buzzword, unfortunately. Fortunately and unfortunately. I say fortunately and unfortunately. Fortunately because it's on the mind of God. Unfortunately because some people hijack it, take it, and say, okay, this is what we're going to do, so we'll have couple of services, say we had revival, and go right back to what we were doing. And the interesting thing is when things come around full circle, people start to say, okay, we want to see, we want to see miracles, or, or, or we want to see a move of God, or we want to see an outpouring, we want to see, and then there are certain places where God has been doing that continually as a culture. Um, someone asked him, are you in revival? And his answer was, I've never been out of one. <laughs> yeah. I felt in my heart that I remember, you know, walking in the season. Now we're seeing the miraculous and these different things. And the first miracle I ever saw was, first significant miracle I ever saw, because salvation is a miracle, but I'm talking about physical miracle I saw was actually sitting in the Tabernacle of World Harvest Church back in the 90s when R.W. Shambach came and prayed for a boy who was blind and received his sight. And I remember saying, I want that. And uh, my I want that was not just, you know, I'll keep doing whatever I'm doing, but I'll do whatever it takes to pursue a move of God in my life. And I felt like it would be a disservice to all of us to talk about revival while knowing and friends with and in relationship with one of God's generals and someone who has been continuously walking revival who has something to impart and then not have him impart it would be a disservice to all of us. I'm believing God for an impartation. I'm going to say that again. I'm believing God for an impartation. You're talking about the first individual to go and preach revival after the communist wall and Soviet Union fell and watched people in the Red Army come down and give their life to Christ at the preaching of the gospel, has seen more than what most of us would probably say we've seen combined. And I feel like if there's anyone who can walk with that kind of testimony, that kind of history, that kind of experience, we should want to hear from them. And so it's our distinct honor to introduce to you someone who doesn't actually need an introduction, but I want you to understand it. Who you are hearing from is someone that God has allowed us to live in the same generation with. Would you help me welcome the ministry of Pastor Rob Parsley?
Let's the incomparable Pastor William McDowell. Would you thank God for that gift, please? Now, would you thank God? Some of you need to close your eyes. Would you thank God for that gift? Uh, you may be seated. You, you may be seated. I, I don't wind up. I'm ready. I'm not going to start slow and then crescendo for you. Because I learned how to preach. You laugh at me, it'll get on you. I want to thank God for the unspeakable gift of Bishop Garlington. I am. Be seated. wash his feet I humble myself before him hmm. the latter tenfold increase over the former these are the feet of quiet authority that demons fear and principalities tremble. Speak it, and it is done. Think it, and I'm already setting it in place. For your heart and my heart are one, says God. I'm well pleased. Enjoy me, says the Lord. Enjoy me. No more struggle. Free flow. I bless you now. I bless you. Spirit, soul, and body, and in all that pertains to life and godliness, be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Uh, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't win a whole city by myself. Oh, thank you. thank you, Jesus. 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 Stand up. Stand up. Every attack a breakthrough. <laughs> Every tear a celebration. I counted you worthy to place him in your hands. And you have done well. And I am pleased. And in the next three months, you will see your greatest prayer not heard but it answered. Says God. I take this down just a little bit for me. Uh, 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 mm. Where's Corey? Hi, Corey.
million. Million. Can you handle the burden of wealth? Thank you, Jesus. Three more songs soon. 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 No seeking, just a download. Oh! Thank you, Jesus. Uh, there are two major forms of prophecy. The one most people understand is the one where we call those things that be not as though they were. Uh, that's, that's an elementary form of prophecy. It belongs to every believer. It belongs to every believer. You would, you would recognize it as declare and decree. Mark 11, 22, 24. Have faith in God. For truly I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. But believe those things that he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Let me parenthetically insert, what is your adversary going to do with you when you know you shall have it? Now, if you're hoping you're going to have it, that's totally different. But when you know you shall have it, for God to do nothing is impossible. That's impossible. Say, for God to do nothing is impossible. You speak the thing, all of heaven backs you. All of heaven backs you. All of heaven backs you. But there's another form of prophecy. That would be the seer. In moments like this, I am not declaring a thing for it to be. It already is, or I couldn't see it. You, every single person stand now. Not every single one of you. I mean every person who is single. I just had husbands and wives looking at each other like, what do I not know? That was a behold moment. What the? It's just about the same. Look at this. Scoot over a little bit, buddy. I need your chair. Thank you. You're all single, meaning you're not married. Stop looking at yourself as incomplete. God needs an army of single people who are not bound by spouse and children. You need to learn to celebrate your singleness because you can give all. I said, you can give all. So if you're her, stop looking for him and start seeking him. Let God use you in your singleness. You will never be a complete person married until you are first complete single. Stop looking. Stop looking. If you want to be married, put it before God one time. Pray with specificity. Pray with specificity. I was single until I was 29. By the time I was 29, I took five people 
gathered together in my first meeting and while I was still single and before I was 30 years old built the largest tabernacle ever built north of the Mason-Dixon line east of the Mississippi River ever still has never been duplicated because I was single and I could give myself 150 nights a year preaching this gospel and pastoring I just felt that in my belly calm down chill out relax pray with specificity pray one time and walk away from it after that you say well what do I do between the time I prayed and he or she shows up well between here and there there's a praise on it no you didn't hear a word I said I said between here and there there's a praise on it there's a hallelujah a thank you Jesus a bless his name but pray with specificity now I, I prayed I used to pray for a wife and then I saw what was showing up as an answer then I decided to pray with specificity it wasn't you know it wasn't eloquent it's just something like God I don't want to wake up every morning and look at an ugly woman I don't want no ugly woman you pray however you want to I prayed with specificity I wanted a woman like Jesus I want a woman created from the foundation of the world for me. And once you get that one, you won't ever look at another one. Oh, I, I found it. I'm just, I'm just looking. Be seated. Hallelujah. Pastor, we, we talk about revival. Now, if I have to... For y'all, I'll go home. Because theatrics have replaced preaching. Oh, I want to go somewhere. Counseling has replaced deliverance. Services have replaced service. We shout, we want revival. And if I passed the mic and said, tell me what it is. Many would have no earthly idea what it is. And I will shock you, many of you, when I tell you what it is. I'm just going slow. Is everybody all right? Revival is not shouting. Revival is not praying. A baby shouts when it's born naturally. You should never be required or encouraged to shout. I'm going to expose to you the reason that we do have to encourage. Why we have to get to two and four. And they're going to take the whiteboard to tell you, but I'm going to tell y'all. I'm from eastern Kentucky, and two and four did not originate with y'all. Two and four is Scotch-Irish. It came here to the Appalachians. Are you with me? (laughs) Now understand that most white folk lost it (laughs) and can't find it. So y'all continue to help us. Hallelujah. What is revival? What does it mean? Why are we all here? What is this all about after all?
I am concerned that we only have prophets who prophesy to their own gain. I'm weary with men who spend more time on their nails than they do in prayer. I'm tired of airbrushed pictures and seven foot tall cutouts of five foot tall men. Why are we here? What is this all about after all? Is this a show? Is it theatrics? Is it an attempt to gain the t attention of the culture? God didn't call us to b blend in with the culture. He called us to change the culture. Okay, you're not going to shout me down. I, I need Pastor William to get up here and do that voice of his. It's a good thing God gave that to you and not me. Because he knew I'd never shut up. If I could do that, I'd just do it all day. But I, I do rejoice in God tonight. Because the pastor didn't, didn't really tell the half of it. It was nearly three years that I had no microphone and Bible. It was a year and a half of absolute silence. It was vocal cords covered with cancer. It was fourth degree burns inside my throat and outside my throat. If you want Satan to stop revival, silence the gospel preacher. Let us heap unto ourselves teachers. Having itching ears. The teacher, of course, the only of the fivefold ministry office gifts that has innately within it no ability, no power to convict the human heart of sin. That's why it was singled out. The apostle convicts of sin, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, but not the teacher. Does that mean the teaching gift is unnecessary? No, in this hour, it's more necessary than ever. Because what we are eating until we regurgitate it is showmanship. I can give you five catchphrases right now and having you throw the chairs. I can entertain you. I can even whoop. And I'm white. Most of you watched me for 10 years on, on, heard me, and then you walked in your living room and said, He white. I could tell you a story about a dog that would make a cat cry. That's a gift. I could stand here and quote with silvery tongued eloquence anything out of the Bible that I wanted to. I could move you in your emotions. I could stagger you in your mind. Why would God create people that he knew were going to go to hell? We can't give an answer concerning our faith, but we can.
Where are those prophets that walk through the center aisle and read your mail about you being in the worship service last night, then going out and fornicating before you came back tonight? Why are you looking at me for me? I know you saying, send a white boy home quick. No, I don't. You love it. You love it. I know who I'm in front of. I know my audience. You don't come with worship like this. You don't come with passion like this and not have a heart for God. But because you have a heart for God does not mean you're saved. Look at your neighbor and go, shh. He's about to say something. No civilization ever dies until the church dies. No church dies until that preacher dies. There were seven churches in the book of Revelation, singled out in chapters 1 through 3. Seven of them, they were given birth to in the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey. They were located in Asia Minor. There were not seven different letters written to the seven different churches. There were seven chapters of the same book. That book was circulated among the churches. Now some say that those churches were geographically located and situated in time. And they were seven real actual churches in the first century. That's all true. Seven amazing cities. If I would describe them to you, you would be astounded. Amazing cities. And these churches, the central portion of every one of them. Everything in the city, all of its commerce, all of its art, all of its architecture, centered around that church. It was alive and vibrant. It was moving and evangelistic. It was missionary minded. It didn't think about itself. It thought about the world around us. There on the ports. So that it could be transported to the world. Why are we here? All seven of those churches ceased to exist. By the year 320 A.D. 320 years. Now let's remember. They weren't birthed at the let's go to the conference and figure out how to give church, how to plant churches. Am I saying we don't need to plant churches? Oh, we definitely need to plant churches. In fact, I have planted 127 churches. In the last 14 months. Because I discovered something. 80% of all the people that will be born again in America this year. Will be born again in a church that is two years of age or less. Why they die. The average church in America lasts eight years from birth to out of business. I need water. Eight years. A mall lasts 12. My question to you is a simple one. What are we doing? The apex of all Christian endeavor. Now, there's a lot of Christian endeavor. You can write books. Everybody I know writes a book. Sometimes I ask them, 
Why do you want to write a book carried around in your trunk full? I mean, if you've got no audience, why are you writing a book? They do the same thing with music. Everybody I see, you want to hear my CD? No, and obviously neither did anyone else. We have made a mistake in that, and please understand how much I love you. I wouldn't talk like this if you weren't the best God's got. So just take heart. Most folk couldn't come anywhere near handling what I'm going to tell you. We have entertainers. The church in America is losing three million men and women a year walking away. Now I'm not talking about all churches, I'm talking about evangelical churches. We are losing more churches every year than are starting. The fastest growing religion in America is no longer Christianity. It is Islam. Just say the word revival. In my parents' generation, 65% of the men and women walking the streets of America not only went to a Bible-believing church at least one time a week. Do you know how often the average evangelical attends church? One time every six weeks. Am I telling the truth? So, like, we can do one of two things. We can splash around in a little bit of muddy water and act like we're having a revival. Or we can get the real thing. I want the real thing. And I, I need to tell you, Pastor, you attempted to get this building. But your father was given a word from God tonight of why you didn't get it. This place is too small. This is too... What you've seen in Africa, you will see here. And nothing will hinder you and nothing will stop you because I have seen your heart purified before me and your motives clear as gold, says the Almighty. Now get ready. Get ready. Just lift your hands right now because it's coming down out of heaven. It's coming down out of heaven. The place of habitation is coming down out of heaven right now. I have not prophesied that for 20 years. The last time I prophesied it, 30 churches got buildings within the next 30 days. I'm not playing. I'm not calling something into being. I'm telling you what I see. No, you need to shout over it right now. Come on. Don't make him have to get up here and tune. Don't make the organ have to roar. You roar. Roar, Judah. Come on, worship him for a minute. Worship him for a minute. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning. Ask and you receive. Seek and you find. Knock, it's opened unto you. This is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything 
According to his word, he hears us. According to his will, he hears us. And we know with steadfast confidence and assurance we have granted for our present possession. Say, I have it. Say, I have it. Stand up. And you got the money to pay for it too. You have you have it. 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 Now, church, the enemy in the firmament, you already secured it in prayer. You've had men to help you, but you've secured it in prayer. But the prince of Persia in the firmament is attempting to block it. Make him let it go. Not him. Not pastor. You. You. Shake it out with a praise. This time when you shout, he's not only going to let habitations building go, he's going to get you out of debt in your house. Get your ministry out of debt. Houses are falling. I ain't going to get in the way of it. It took you too long to get right here. Be seated. Be seated. Don't be a spectator. Is that all you're going to do? For him put you in a house you didn't build? full of good things you didn't buy? We call in every brick. We call in every electrical wire. We call in every ceiling tile. We call in the PA system and the television equipment to broadcast habitation around this world. Hey, come here. Get her to come here. I'm getting drunk. Get her to come here. 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 Ha. 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 Oh, Rusty. He got no room. I got no room. I got no room. I give myself to you, says the Lord. I give myself to you. Look, look, raise up, raise up. Every scar leaves. Every scar. Every scar leaves. You got scars, emotional scars, painful scars. In the name of Jesus, I command them to leave you now. Look, you gotta, you got to have confidence in a word, not in the volume at which that word is delivered. You 
are healed now. 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 Every tumor leaves this building. Every knot and growth leaves this building. Prostate cancer leaves this building. If you've had prostate problems, come right now. Come right now. Hurry. 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 If you're a female and you have had issues in your female organs, come now. Come now. Come now. I'm not playing. I'm not playing. It doesn't have anything to do with your faith right now. It doesn't have anything to do with your faith right now. Go over there. Okay. Endometriosis. Endometriosis. Yeah. Where? Raise your hand. Endometriosis, where? Huh? Where? Right there? Right there? You better separate them. You better separate them. You? Put your hands on your... Thank you. Thank you. It's not my business to touch you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Put your other hand there, please. Every pain. I'm not going to pray for this woman. I'm going to pray through this woman. And if you will but give God a sign that you believe, when I lay my hand on her, your pain, I don't care where it is. Go! I don't care where it is in your body. I don't care where it is in your body. Every pain goes now. Every pain goes. The Holy Ghost just, just, just spoke to me that I need to curse the root of the pain. I need to curse the source of the pain. Because pain is not your adversary. Say, pain is not my enemy. Pain is an indicator that your enemy exists. Did you hear me? This, Bishop Garlington, I full well believe is why we can't get Christians in a state of consecration. Because they do not understand the difference between conviction and condemnation. We have stifled our preachers from speaking the word of our deliverance. Because we have said, don't put that on me. Don't condemn me. When what they're doing in the spirit is bringing conviction to your heart. For conviction is to your heart what pain is to your body. An indicator that there's a problem. Without pain, you could walk down a beach, cut your foot on a jagged bottle, and bleed out. And never know it. And we got a whole lot of dead churchgoers who bled out long ago but will not allow the convicting power of the Holy Spirit because preachers have become ad, 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 preachers have become adept at helping you sear your conscience with the hot iron of emotionalism. You better pray to feel him in something other than goosebumps and a shout. Oh, this church, you all can handle this. You all can handle this. You all can handle this. Lay your hands on your body, wherever your situation is, close to it as you can get. I'm not going to lay hands on you because that's another thing we've done. We become worshipers in personality cults. The more people fall down in rapid succession, the more anointing we think they have. We never bothered to see if anything actually happened. Now, are you ready? These signs shall follow those who believe in his name. Do you believe in his name? Then raise your left hand. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ, Jehovah Joshua Messiah, that exactly the same anointing that you put in my left hand in the Adams Mark Hotel in 1979 in Indianapolis, Indiana, that the same anointing that is resident in me 
which rested in your servant, Smith Wigglesworth, which rested upon your servant, Lester Sumrall, which rested upon your servant. Oh. To fall on every one of these left hands now. In the name of Jesus. Now say, I have it. Say, I have it. I command every thyroid to be healed now. Just put your left hand on your body wherever anything is attempting to not line up with God's word and shout this body. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you now, be made whole. You were not made for fornication and you were not made for sickness and disease. My God has healed my wounds now in Jesus' name. Now throw both hands up in the air and either shout, dance, run, clap, spin, wave. Let me tell you what God's doing for you right now. Keep shouting. Let me tell you what he's doing for you right now. He's making you no longer need healing. He is making you a healer, a healer, a healer, a healer, a healer, a deliverer. You are a deliverer by your presence, by your prayer. By your prophetic word. Now shall I receive it? Okay, run back to your seat. Don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. Hey! See, at some point, preachers have to enable the people instead of being intoxicated as the people celebrate them. Most preachers can't handle a crowd. It ruins them. They become intoxicated. So they begin to know what moves the crowd. And because the crowd does not have pastors, They have hirelings, but they don't have pastors. He said he would give you pastors after his own heart, not so that you would be after. And what has happened is the church has systematically been robbed of her discernment. So we see gifting and we see anointing and we celebrate it and allow them to put that spirit on all of us, not the spirit of the showman. Not the spirit of the gift, but the spirit of a lack of consecration. The average evangelical preacher in America today prays eight minutes a day. Eight minutes a day. Now that's what they confess to. So naturally it's a lot less than that because they liars too. Anybody that will steal from you, lie to you. Anybody that will lie to you, steal from you. So I'm trying to answer the question. Why are we here? What is this all about? The apex 
of all Christian endeavor. The apex. Why do we need worship? Why do we praise? Why do we receive offerings? Why do we have youth ministry? Why do we need microphones? Why do preachers need airplanes? Why do we need television cameras? If this is normal to any other night, uh, Pastor McDowell allowed us to, to broadcast now live over the Breakthrough Network. Over one million people will see this. Why? Why? If we can't answer the why, what are we doing? There was a fellow I was, I was doing a service in a, a facility for folks that had, had been strung out on drugs for a long time. And I was young in ministry, bishop, and I, I started my sermon with why that's when I preach sermons why are we all here and they just looked at me like you and I said why are we all here finally a fellow stood up in the back and said uh preacher I perceive that we're all here because we're not all there <laughs> that's a true story why 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 are we all here the apex i was i was in my office at my desk i have a door to my left and i got up to go out that door the next thing i knew i was two doors down the hallway with my head and shoulders underneath a chair. No one was there but me. The, the team was there, but they weren't in that area. I just got, I was signing letters, and I just got up and walked down the hallway. That's where I was going. And I ended up under a chair. Now, I'm Baptist. I'm not a Calvinist, but I am Baptist. Calvinist. And I woke up. My face covered in tears. Shaking. And all I heard were these words. The apex of all Christian endeavor must become to place the jewel of a soul in the crown of our Savior so that the Lamb of God slain may receive the reward of his suffering. Now, I found out later that so that the Lamb of God slain may receive the reward of his suffering was actually a chant of Moravian missionaries. I had never studied that. I did not know that. It just came up out of my belly. Stand up. No polyps. No nodules. No lesions. No pain. No tightness. Ever again. Ever. Your vocal range 
will change this night mainly in your lower register because there has been an attack there which leaves you now by the power of God. By the power of God. By the power of God. Just pray in the Holy Ghost just a minute. Now some of you have said, I've been, I've been watching Pastor Rod for years. I have never seen him like this. Because I'm not who I was. I have a new assignment. Do you want to know what revival is? Because you want it, don't you? Well, that was weak. <laughs> you're not sure because now you're not sure what it is. It's not shouting. It's not miracle signs and wonders. Well, he's against miracle signs and wonders. You've got to be kidding me. Like, what are you smoking? No, like, really, what are you smoking? No, no, no. I've, I've witnessed, Pastor, thank you for that overboard introduction, but I have been around the world. I basically lived with a man who walked in Chiang Kai-shek's China in Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia who was in Israel during four of their six wars. I, I lived with a man who cast the demon spirit out of one girl in Billy Bib prison in Manila, the Philippines, and 150,000 adults gave their lives to Christ as a result of that one deliverance. I walked with a man who understood You'll have better results in healing ministry if you don't line everybody up and lay your hands on everybody because everybody's not worthy. Smith Wigglesworth had over 90% success rate in instantaneous healings and raised seven people from the dead. And you say, well, how would he have such astounding results because he was led by the spirit and he would not lay his hands on anybody but those people that God said lay their hand your hands on them again theatrics line them all up knock them all down get the band going make sure you got skinny jeans Don't never wear no socks. Because we got to be relevant. So you watch everything that Motown and New York City and Hollywood does and you mimic it in the church. And because the body of Christ has no discernment, you ain't got much goods, but dang, you look good. I like skinny jeans. I would wear them if I were skinny, <laughs> which I am not. But I'm 61 and having fun, I promise you that. Listen to me. Your anointing is not based on what you wear. If you got a dress kooky, I, some, I saw some cat the other day. I'm not even going to talk about it. I saw some cat the other day in the pulpit of God, and I thought, what in the name of Jesus are we even thinking about? This is still a holy place. That is still a holy desk. These are still God's holy people. 
And I think we'd be real good if we'd start going that direction a little stronger again. Whoever you like, if President Obama or President Bush, I don't know. I don't care. They did everything they could do to get me to run for the United States Senate. And ten businessmen put their money together and tried to get me to run for president. Do you know what I told them? Why would I want a demotion? I don't want nothing to do with that mess. I'm a kingdom man. Stone monuments will crumble. Empires will fall. But the word of that gospel preacher will remain forever. I'm about to run up in here now. Be seated. We don't honor ministry gifts anymore for the main reason they haven't been honorable. Are you invite me back? Okay. I don't care. I ain't looking for a place to be. I'm a truth teller. Not a fact teller. I don't care what your fact is. My truth can change your fact. The fact was, I had vocal cord cancer. The truth was, I was healed 2,000 years ago. Ah, don't you feel God in here? I said, don't you feel God in here? Okay, I'm going to hurry because they told me we have to be out of here at 11. I'll hurry. Be seated. At least I'm not making you stand up the whole time. <laughs> I got to stand up the whole time. The apex of all Christian endeavor must become to place the jewel of the soul in the crown of our Savior. I don't care how many you got coming on Sunday morning. Oh, he got 20,000. Doing what? Well, they're coming. What are they getting when they get there? Well, I mean, come on, y'all. I've been at this a long time. I've seen it, man. I laid hands on a boy. Huh. I'm sorry. I'm just seeing a whole lot. And if I start seeing everything I'm seeing, we, we won't get out of the I laid hands on a boy after a Wednesday night service and everybody had gone home and they brought the boy up to me he had hydroencephaly his head was larger than his shoulders but he had no cerebellum he had only a brain stem See if your skinny jeans can fix that. Or your 42 button zoot suit. Remember those? Shoulder pads out to here. Oh, come on. On them buttons. <laughs> I, during that time period, I had preachers late all the time. They couldn't get their coat buttoned up. Hey, Amen. Me and D.D. Jakes, man, we had pants that the legs were big enough to make three suits out of. <laughs> you know. I don't care if you're relevant. You don't even understand what relevant is. You think relevant has to do with fashion, light shows, kind of PA you got. If your service is an hour and 15 minutes or 25 hours. Relevant is to be connected to the issue. But if you don't know the issue, then you are irrelevant. It doesn't matter how much church we have. It doesn't matter what crowds we've got. It doesn't, none of that matters. 
The devil celebrates that. Tomorrow, in Columbus, Ohio, when O-H-I-O lines up, there will be 110,000 people. None of them will be healed. So a crowd doesn't really matter. What matters is a cloud. No, there's... Are you seeking to build a crowd? I wonder what Bible most preachers have. Your Bible said the kingdom of God is like a great tree that grows and puts forth its branches. And the bigger it gets, the more every evil, foul thing comes and lodges in its branches. We get so busy pulling in the net, we forget to sort the fish. Now I'm going to hit them. I've been nice to this point. I laid hands on that boy after, after a Wednesday night service. Organist was gone. Nobody there. Me and that family, that little baby, trying to hold its head. So I laid hands on it. The fact was, it looked exactly the same after I did that it did before I did. Until the next week. When the news had to report, here's the baby with its head larger than its shoulders. This is in America. Now, and nothing but water, only a brain stem keeping it alive. Now here's the baby with a normal size head and a fully functioning brain. Because I told God that night in my bedroom, if you can put a brain in my head, in my mother's womb, you can put a brain in this baby outside the womb. Location does not. Come on. Be seated. You know how many people came to Christ as a result of that miracle? None. It pleases God, not through the working of miracle or the gifts of healing or knocking people in the floor or your light show, but through the foolishness of preaching. Some of you preachers need to get foolish. The other day I was preaching and the Holy Ghost came on me and I looked in that camera and I told every preacher, tear your notes up. What would happen if you had to depend on God? Oh, I got this one all worked out, man. I got it all alliterated. I got the pitiful Palestinian sun beating down into his open wounds to look up as though the very flames of hell itself had embedded themselves deep in the flesh of the only begotten Son of God. Here's revival. Here's revival. Are you watching? When the church gets saved. The way we got saved. The way we got saved. I got born again when I was eight years old. I had hormones in my teens like everybody else. 
the prettiest cheerleader on the squad, invited me to the prom. I was driving a brand new fire engine red Trans Am with 400 horsepower. And I had money in my pocket. She put her finger out like that. She said, now let me tell you one thing, plastic Jesus. I am a virgin, and I don't intend to be after the prom. And I said, you a devil. Let me tell you why. Because I was saved. These little lily liver jelly back preachers run around and say, aren't you tempted by women? I mean, I just can't get these women to leave me alone. I wonder why they don't leave you alone. Because you two-thirds homosexual. You've got a good cover. Don't look at me funny. You ought to be shouting, go ahead and speak, prophet. If I was prophesying you a new Mercedes, that's what you'd be doing. We got to grow up. If you speak in tongues, do it now. Yeah, dance now. Shout now. Shout with any, without anybody helping you. Shout your own shout. Dance your own dance. Pastor not going to be there on Tuesday afternoon. Be seated. Somebody said it earlier and they were absolutely right. I have been to every church planting, church growth, seminar, whole nar, whatever you want to call it. Every one of them, they invite me. And I just watch. Not one time have I ever heard the Holy Spirit mentioned. Except one of the largest ones, the leader got up and said, made an excuse in case any of the participants heard anybody speak in tongues. Now you tell me how we're going to build his church that was birthed on the day of Pentecost without the Holy Ghost. It's not his church. It's a bastard church. Be seated. Give me a camera. I said bastard church. It's a whole church. And some of you saints that know the difference, that are letting this counterfeit thing be perpetrated on the next generation, better hit your knees, get on your face, bind up the devil, and show your children what Pentecost is. If they didn't cast out devils in your service last week, don't walk out of there. Shame on you. Run as fast and as hard as you can. Get out. Stop listening to results oriented preachers. Give us some men like Samuel. Samuel's message was moral because he was what he said. Oh, that.
all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew he didn't have to get cutouts of himself and send out mailers telling everybody who he was. All Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a prophet anointed of God. For God let none of his words fall to them. Just lift your hands and say, God, give us something like that. Give us something that will prophesy something besides money. Give us something like that, God. Give us some Samuels that will stand between the left and the right and say you're both wrong. Be seated. Here's what I feel like right now. I feel like your adversary is about to encounter a God with whom he cannot contend. I feel it. I feel like your adversary is about to encounter a God that he can't fence in. Do not think this revival will look like anything you've ever seen. It will not. And I'm not just talking about a revival. I'm talking about an awakening. The greatest. My mother. Be seated. And I'm, I'm getting ready to think about closing directly. I didn't come to perform for you. I can't. But I'm on an assignment. Stand back up. Seven times greater revelation of me, says God, and seven times greater anointing flowing out of your mouth, says the Almighty. Demonstrations and manifestations will follow you every step you take. May I lay my hand on you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Stand up. Stand up. God will not permit you to build it any other way than he shows you in the mountain. Oh, I'm seeing it. It's going to have to come in stages because it's so mighty. It will come in layers, says God. Layers and layers and layers and layers. Layers. I rebuke every sickness, disease, pain, malady, malfunction, and infirmity in the glorious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here it is. My precious mother, now going to be with the Lord on January 30th of this year, she was 82. When I was growing up, she had two things on her nightstand beside her bed, neither of which was a remote control. <laughs> there weren't any. Do you know the major issue with the church, Pastor? It can't miss but it's never seen. We must be careful that we do not give way to a generation who knows not God. They know church, but they don't know him. So, number one was a King James bishop. <laughs> A uh, King James Thompson chain reference. <laughs> and you couldn't even find the words in it for the writing and the tears. And the... the 
The other book was by one of my fondest mentors. Most of you won't know him. The book was written 1959 by the great Leonard Ravenhill. It's a book called Why Revival Tarries. And my mother would read it to my sister and I through one time every year. And now people call me a revivalist. I don't think they really know why. Maybe it's because every time I look in that camera and give an altar call, 10,000 people give their lives to Christ. Every time. I do it six times a week. That's 60,000 a week. But I'm fearful. I'm apprehensive. I'm, I'm apprehensive that I will spend my life preaching to a church that thinks it's saved and is not. The great Leonard Ravenhill declared in 1959, truer words were never spoken and more relevant today than they were then. He said, I am concerned that not even 5% of the people in evangelical pews are born again. Not even 5%. We didn't know. I built a church by the grace of God, from eight, five people, 17 all together, the rest of them were my family members. I, I didn't have an offering container. I didn't have a next steps program. I didn't have any literature. I didn't have an advertising budget or any money to pay it if I did. But I had a word from God. We built a 100 an 80-seat building, a year and a half later, we were doing five services in it. So we expanded it to 400 seats. Half a year later, we were back to five services in that, so we built a 1,200-seat one. The third service we were in that, we had to go to overflow, and then we went to five services in it within six months. And then we built a 5,200-seat Sanctuary, by the time I'm 29 years old, in eight years, from nothing to over 5,000 people. But I'll tell you what I did have. In 1979, God put his healing power in my hands. He gave me a ministry of deliverance. I had to get my whole family baptized in the Holy Spirit. I had one service where 300 plus Baptist people got instantaneously baptized in the Holy Ghost. But what I never lost was not what I received when I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It was what I received way back yonder. That the whole reason we're here, listen to me, is because somebody you love is not. Now, I know you want me to say something different. I get it. The church is an adoption agency. You run from this one to that one based on what kind of an idolatrous life that guy will preach is okay for you. I said that. Are you born again? L let me just let me just help you. If you still have a lust problem, you're not saved. See some backslidden preacher 
told you otherwise. He told you you were free because you were in grace. The only thing grace does for you is free you to choose. That's it. Grace wasn't even available before the cross. Only mercy. We're so uneducated. Because we've had too much shoe dust in me. Come on now. Are you saved? If that world has any allure to you, you didn't get the real thing. May this damnable doctrine forever be silenced in the ears of God's people. You say, well, how are they God's people if they're not saved? Everybody's God's people. The best organist is probably not in this service. He's out on a bar stool somewhere because nobody got to him. I'm quitting. Cyrus Schofield. Most of you don't know him because you are of the Pentecostal persuasion. And you know Finest Jennings Dake and the Dake Bible. But most of you do not know Schofield and the Schofield Bible. I know both because I'm still a Baptist, but I'm a Pentecostal. You with me? Cyrus Schofield wrote, arguably, the greatest reference Bible ever produced. But let me tell you his story. Cyrus Schofield was an attorney and a very ungodly one. So Schofield was in his office. He'd been doing some work for a young man, and the young man looked across that great oaken desk, and he said, uh, uh, Mr. Schofield, why are you not yet saved? And Mr. Schofield replied, I'm an evil man. That's not what I asked you. Why are you not yet saved? I suppose it's because no one ever asked me. Where are your, I'm not looking at you. Where are your children tonight? Where are your spouses? Where are the people that you love so much? And why? Why are you okay that they're lost? Oh, because our preachers don't preach about hell anymore. That's not a reality. Jesus preached three times more about hell than he did heaven. How about your local pastor? There's only one thing we all have in common that nobody wants to talk about. It's called sin. You are not saved because you went to church. Now, I'm going to give you three. Nicodemus asked Jesus. I don't have any higher authority. No denomination taught me this. Watch. John chapter 3, Nicodemus said, What must I do to receive eternal life? To enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, You must be born again. Nicodemus was like, Cool. How do I go back into my mother's womb and be birthed a second time? I preached in three of the largest attended conferences in one year back to back. At the end of every one of them, which all lasted a week, I gave an altar call for salvation. Each of the hosts of each of those told me that was the only altar call given 
the entire week. My question is, what are we doing? What, what are we doing? Just talking to ourselves? Do you know why those churches all died? Three reasons. Number one, they lost their evangelistic zeal. They thought it was okay just to go to church. Secondly, they lost their missionary drive. They became introverted. Do you know what they were overrun by? Islam. All of them destroyed by Islam. I may be the only preacher. That government agencies have to come and drag my children out of their beds in the middle of the night and take them to unclosed locations and hide them for weeks. But I'm not afraid. There is only one book, one God, Oprah, I love you. There are not many ways to God. There is one way. His name is Jesus Christ. I got to quit, man. Be seated. You say, what's he so happy about? Well, real prophets are rejoicing when the people are weeping. Three ways. Jesus gave three interpolated negatives. Not telling you how you can be born again, but rather how you cannot be. Number one, you cannot be born, John chapter 1, of the will. uh, You cannot be born of bloods. What does that mean? This is one of the major problems we have in the church, dear heart. Because good mothers took their children to church right? Their whole life, just like this. That's the way I was raised. And they didn't give me no trucks to play with. And we didn't have no nursery even. You understand? We was in church around the anointing. And so, and so, but they raised in church and they think they saved because they learned how to church. Because they learned how to church. They say all the right things. They know when to raise their hands. They even get a quickening every now and then. And every, but they're not saved. You can't be saved by bloods. Christianity is the fastest growing religion that is a non-birth religion. You understand? You can't just be born into this thing. You have to be born again into this thing. Okay, now, quickly. Secondly, you cannot be born Of the will of the flesh. What does that mean? This is the damnable lie. I'm going to crush it. And I'm going to go home and sleep really good. Here's the damnable lie. That you're supposed to come. And pray a prayer. And turn around and go back. And start attempting to be better. And if you can't get better. We'll send you to a counselor. Jesus, I think people, I have preachers say to me in hotel lobbies, aren't you tempted to, to drink that liquor when you get back to your hotel room? And no more than I would be to drink gasoline. I don't, I, I, like, I don't understand. I'm, nothing out there means anything to me. Take my houses. Y'all trying to get a house. Take my houses. Take my lands. Change my dreams, change my plans, but do not take your spirit from me. Jesus. Not of the will of the flesh. Not by trying to be better. Not by trying to be good. Not by trying to, you know, watch somebody next to you and pray like they pray. Thirdly, you cannot be born again of the will of men. What does that mean? Making a decision. 
Oh, man, you want to get my dander up? Let me hear somebody calling people to Jesus to make a decision. A decision. A decision is what you're going to make when you go to McDonald's when I quit. Whether you want a Big Mac or a quarter pounder with cheese. That's a decision. We're not talking about a decision. Haddon Spurgeon said, the problem with the modern church is they have decisions without conversions. Now let me tell you what the book says, and the book is right, and they are wrong. If any man be in Christ, old things are passed away, and all things are become new to him. If you still want and have to war against what you used to want, you're not a new creature. God bids men come to Christ and die. And die. Die to what? Poverty, part of the curse, sickness, and sin. To your will, and your way, and your plan. You see, you tell, modern preachers tell this generation, oh, come to Christ. He has a plan for your life. You know what they say? Well, I hope to shout, because I'm all that. God's here to serve me. I have a right. Demanding their rights, forsaking their responsibilities. So we have to have all these programs. We're going to teach you how to serve. Look, if you don't have a heart to serve, you didn't get it. God said he'd put a new heart in you. Not some preacher will take you to class and teach you how to be better. This is my son. Right here. This is my son. Right here. That's my son. Prophet Antonio Burroughs. Right there. That's my son. That's my son. This young lady, she my daughter. None of them have the same pigmentation as me. Are you looking at me? And guess what? I didn't have to go to some preacher's reconciliation seminar to learn how to love them. I can't help it. I'm born again of the Spirit of God. I could no more dislike them because of the color of their skin than I could cut my arms off. I don't have to be trained. Y'all quit yelling for white people to get trained and just tell them to get saved. Just get saved, man. Get saved. I don't love you because I have to, because some law told me to, because somebody trained me to. I love you because I can't, quite frankly, help it. I don't love my wife. Because I went to the marriage seminar. I love my wife. Just as naturally as a baby shouting when it comes out of its mother's womb. I'm born again. I'm born again. I don't sin daily in word, thought, and deed. You a liar. I'm his. Now that's grace, my brother. Not for permission, except the permission to choose the right and eschew the wrong. And it's not even a struggle. There was a fellow, he was perspiring last night when I went to the hotel after preaching three hours. And, and he was standing there opening the door. And he said, he was at the hotel. He said, God bless you, preacher. So I stuck my hand in my pocket. And grabbed a hundred dollar bill and gave it to him. 
and said, God bless you, son. I didn't have to have some preacher work hocus pocus to get me to give up. I didn't, I didn't do anything. You want that one? You want that one? You want that one? I can buy it. Hey, 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 go buy my buddy some Western stuff. Whew. Oh, there, son, I'm telling you, he is such a gift. Such a gift, Carson. What a gift. I just want you to know something, y'all. Don't be trying to do this thing and not truly know that you're born again. All right? I mean, I, I could do a lot of things. I could take up an offering. I could do But what I care about is that I didn't stand in front of you tonight and you end up in hell. Because when we really get it, no one will have to teach you to witness. No one will have to plan your prayer life. Nobody will have to give next steps and first steps and third steps to get you back to church. Nobody had to get me back to church. I got a drink of water. I knew where the well was, man. I didn't have to have a show. Haddon Spurgeon said, if you have to have a circus to get them there, you'll have to have a circus to keep them. God, help our churches not to be circuses. Help us to be born again. Help us to realize the only reason we're all still here is because somebody else is not. And you've anointed us to go reach them. Let us take from this habitation conference this truth that we are full of the power of God, the presence of God, the anointing of God, the victory of God, because there are people all around us that are dying without Christ, and it's our responsibility to reach them. See, they don't shout about this. And that's okay. Just lay your hands on your heart right now. Very quickly. I'm going to count to three. If you want to absolutely know beyond any shadow of a doubt, because your Bible said that the Holy Spirit would bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. If you want to know that better than you know your own name and you don't know it right now, if you've been going through the motions, I don't care if you're a deacon, an elder, a board member, a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, a worship leader. I gave an altar call the other day in the church that had 300 people in the choir and two-thirds of them gave their life to Jesus. They realized, I, I'm just going through the motions on this thing. I'm not, I'm not really alive unto God. And I want to be. Nobody doesn't want to be. We all want to be, and we can be. That's why Jesus came. Every head bowed, and eye, every eye closed, no one looking around. I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I'm not going to ask you to make a decision. I'm going to ask you, do you want to become a new creature in Christ Jesus? Sins forgiven. Absolute knowledge you're on your way to heaven and ready to work in his kingdom. When I say three, if that's you, raise your hand. Do it bravely and boldly. Revival is when the church gets saved. Are you ready? On three. I, I rebuke all the pretense. I rebuke all the lies of the adversary and all that torment trying to block you from getting the real thing. Many have been inoculated with just enough of God to never get the real thing. This is it. You're going to go home a brand new mom, dad, son, daughter, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa. This is it. This is for you. I wish you could walk back through. Everybody, keep your head. I wish you could walk back through. I just walked about four rows deep and saw at least 20 people with tears dripping off their chins. That's the real thing. On three, shoot that hand up. Hands are already going up. Do it now. One, two, three. Leave it up. Leave it up. Leave it up. There is no shame. Religion wants to shame you. When I say three, stand to your feet, everyone with your hand raised. One, two, three. Do it now, bravely and boldly. 
No one needs to look around. This is just you and God. Now lay your hands on your belly. And everybody in this building, bravely and boldly, repeat these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm here tonight because I love you. I'm seeking after you. But Lord Jesus, I want to be a new creature. I don't want to have to struggle. I don't want to have to try to resist all the time. I don't want to try to be a better person. I want to become a new creature tonight. Change me from the inside out. Come alive in me. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. Give me blessed assurance. Let me know I'm on my way to heaven. Do it now. Lord Jesus. That's right. Lord Jesus, I accept you, believe in you, confess you as my personal Savior. I am forgiven. I am a new creature. I receive it now by faith. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. So I release to you now the power to become a true child of God. In the glorious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan, loose your hold on every one of these. And I give you glory. I give you glory for it, Jesus. Now, before you can do anything about it, say, I'm so glad to be free. I could almost shout and clap. Oh, why not? Now, everybody stand. I want everybody to tell three people around them, I'm born again. No, go tell somebody, I'm born again. I got a new shout, a new worship. I got a new spirit to serve. I got a new victory in my heart. I'm alive. I'm alive. First thing that doctor looks for is a shout. So everybody that's born again, a new creature, Take just about 15 seconds and let the world know.